the 400 inmates on death row. The main population is held at the state prison in Rayford. James Barnes is one of them. I'd love to have you do, James has signed this. Okay. Are you able to do that? Well, I can put a mark there for you, so. In 1998, James Barnes was given a life sentence for the murder of his wife. However, seven years into this sentence, he confessed to a previous murder, which landed him on death row. Even though I knew that Barnes still had an ongoing appeal, I was determined to be straightforward with him. Mr. Barnes, you should know that uh, sympathizing with your quest to have procedural injustices corrected in mm -hmm. your case it does not necessarily mean that I have to like you. Correct. However, I really am intrigued by the question, how um, does the world outside appear? Do you see the sky? Do you see trees? Do you see a bird nesting somewhere? I'm all the way in the back in a, in a cell where I can see we have two barriers two walkways, hallways, as you would, with bars separating them. Yes. Um, about 10 feet away is a window, but I can't see anything but the building across from me. But if I look down at the end, I can see through a window that's about 15 feet away, and I can see some green um, grass. I can't see some trees that are 700, 800 yards away. It's something. And of course, every once in a while, a bird will will nest uh, for a few days in, in one of the window sills, but... You have observed that? I have observed that. And how big a an event is that? Uh, for, for me, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, I've had cellmates where if a bird chirps, they just go ballistic. They can't stand it, it's making noise. Uh -huh. It's just, there's different um, personalities. Yeah, and, and for you? For me, uh, I, I love the rain. I love when it, I can hear it beat on the, the, the roof. When was the last time you experienced rain on you? <clears throat> I would have to say that it was uh, in 2002. So eight years ago, yes. you had rain on you. Yes. I was in the open population. Um, you know, I've been, in December, I've been locked up for 13 years. Yes. But I haven't spent that whole time on death row. Yeah. Well, it was for a previous uh, conviction Correct. on murder charges. Correct. Yeah. In 1997, Barnes was living in Melbourne on the east coast of Florida. He already had accumulated a considerable rap sheet and was trying to get back together with his estranged wife, Linda. What happened in the crime was he and she, I don't know if they were making amends, but he was staying there somewhat. She found some drugs. Um, they got into an argument over it. He ended up grabbing her in what he calls a sleeper hold and basically... What he, is a sleeper hold? Um, where he took her neck and put it in the crook of his arm um, and, and started to choke her. And actually what ends up happening is he chokes her to death. He strangles her to death. Um, and after he's dead, or after she's dead, um, he has to get rid of the body or make an attempt to get rid of the body and wasn't sure what he was going to do, and so he put her in the closet, in one of the closets in the house, so that if anyone came, they might not see her, um, and, and left her there for a period of time trying to figure out what he could do to dispose of her. When, when law enforcement comes at you and you're, you're cornered, um, this has happened to me several different times. And describe how cornered, in which way? All right, um, I'm going to give you the worst incident that happened. Yes. I was at my father's house. I don't, this was, I was, I was uh, going to be arrested. I didn't know I, what the charge was at the time, but I thought it was for this murder that I'm here on death row for. And this was in 1988. Uh, there was a knock on the door. Well, actually it started with a squirrel in the backyard, looked at me, because I used to feed it peanuts in the morning, and it looked at me, it looked to the side and it bolted up a tree. And I had the sliding glass door open and I looked outside and I saw a police officer with a shotgun and he ducked behind a palmetto bush. I shut the door and stepped back like, did I just see that? I thought it was an illusion at first. So I opened the door and looked again and I didn't see him. Well, I looked at the roof across and there was a cop with a rifle pointed at me. And I, that was terrifying. 
All right, and then I looked through the kitchen out the jealousy windows and there was another cop with a pistol at the side of the house. So I locked the doors and I went to the front and there was a knock and there was a guy I had went to school with who was a warrants officer with a big old 44 Magnum at his side. And I said, oh my God. When I finally did come out of the house, I had over 20 weapons pointed at me. That was severe panic. I, if I would have sneezed, I would have been shot to pieces. It was... Um, the, you were in panic when uh, you, uh, the body of your wife was hidden in the closet. What correct. happened there? Um, it's another incident. This is another incident. Yeah. Um, uh, I was home. Um, the police, well actually her, her, her mother and her sister-in-law and her brother knocked on the door and I opened the door for them and they wanted to know where my wife was and I said that she was at an attorney's. She was going to divorce me. Um, within an hour there was police surrounding the house. Um, they wanted to come in. They wanted to, to search. Um, there was no way out. Uh, it was severe panic. Where was your wife? She was in the closet in the back bedroom. Dead? Yes. Yes, she was dead. And what were his comments? Um, you know, he tried to, to play it off in the interview that um, it was all an accident. That he had gotten mad at her. He had uh, put this chokehold on her to calm her down because she was getting out of control and that in so doing they fell to the floor and when they fell to the floor he said he either must have broken her neck or um, in some form choked her. Now as we go through this interview and keep going on he, he tells us and describes it quite vividly how he picked her up off the ground and to the point where she's shaking and he notices that she urinates on herself which is a little bit different than we fell to the ground and this was an accident. So as, as, the, as the interview goes on, of course, he gets much more descriptive in it and, and, and details you a very violent act and, and very vivid violent act in his memory of, of noting that she's shaking, noting that she urinates in herself. You know, so something that he was cognizant of what's going on at that point in time and it's obvious in my mind and of course it was to the, to the legal system that this was a premeditated act at that point. He was there to kill her. And he made a very nasty, strange remark. You mentioned something. Um, he asked, and I guess I think you're talking about, he asked to have her ex-husband in that part of the interview and that he would confess to the act and tell us the exact truth if the, if the ex-husband was in the room so that the ex-husband could relay her last minutes to her children, which to me is a very, is, it's another violation. Um, and, and for me, he's doing that because that's the ultimate power trip for him. He ends up going out with the power of over the ex-husband and the power over those children by knowing that that's the last thing that they're going to now remember about their mother and his, his, his wife. You know, that that's the last thing that they're going to remember is, is what he told of her last minutes. And, you know, that's, to me, that's a violation to victims all over again. And when he tried to manipulate the course of the interrogation before it really started, was it like a chess game? It, it very much was. We were playing a big game. It, it really was. Um, you know, I, I called at one point probably four hours into the interview, four or five hours, and I think this interview totally is about nine hours from the time I meet him down in our holding cells till we get finished. And at some point in there, I, and I want to say about five hours in, I actually called my supervisor and said, you need to get somebody else here because I'm getting very tired. Because mentally, it was a big challenge of being able to do everything right so that this case could be prosecuted because he was very, very smart in what he was saying. I mean, even to bring up, you know, to ask me, what would an attorney tell me to do? And of course, my answer back was, what do you think they'd tell you to do, James? And then his answer back was, well, they'd tell me not to talk, don't you think? And I said, yeah, that's probably what they do, but you know it's up to you what you do. Do you want an attorney? And then we would move off of that subject. You know, he wanted me to make a mistake in answering that question once again to set up a suppression issue for him to have it thrown out. Somehow to trap you on his right. Miranda rights. Yes, sure. Because so it would be on tape sure. and you would uh, somehow persuade mm -hmm. him not to have an attorney present or something like this. You know, at one point in there he said, I will talk to you and tell you everything if we're not on tape. But you can take all the notes you want knowing that we tape everything. 
So putting me in a position that there would be nothing memorialized, my word against his. Um, I think I'll win that battle, but it muddies the water. And I was trying not to do anything. I, I knew the type of case we had. And he did too. He knew he, he had a problem. He has a dead woman in his closet and he's the only person in there, um, you know, who did that. I mean, that's, he, he knows he has, he has a real problem with this case. So his best bet is to try to find something technically that I do wrong in order to get it thrown out. And that's what he was doing. But very, very intelligent man. There's no question about that. Um, very well schooled in, in the legal system and, and, and the criminal justice system and trying to use it for his, yeah. his own good at that point. I'm very impressed with your abilities to defend yourself in court. For example, in the appeal papers that I've seen, you act as your own attorney? Yes, I did. Under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, I have a right to representation. Yes. The other side of that coin is I have a right to represent myself. Yeah, you invoked the so-called Ferretta right. Right, the Ferretta. Which uh, means you uh, would not be allowed to defend yourself if you were uh, planning to commit uh, state-ordered suicide. So the clock is ticking. It, right now, it started yeah. October 4th. I have one year to have my next yeah. appeal complete. Yeah. James Barnes is awaiting execution for a different crime, one that took place right next to this marina in Melbourne. In prison for his wife's killing, Barnes converted to Islam and during the holy month of Ramadan decided to seek atonement. He confessed to a previous murder. Patricia Miller, a nurse, lived alone in this apartment complex. Leaving all his clothes outside in a bag, Barnes, stark naked, entered and watched her for hours from a closet as she did household chores and watched TV. The murder became known as the burning bed. He actually made a determination that he wanted to sexually assault and kill her. He actually took off all his clothes, went into her apartment, watched her for a period of time, and then assaulted her, bound her, um, tried to strangle her. I don't believe she died at that point, so he picked up a hammer, um, uh, beat her with the hammer, actually killing her, and then in an attempt to destroy as much evidence as he could, he set the bed that she was on on fire. You know, there's, there's a couple different ty types of murder. One's an opportunity mm -hmm. murder. That's like a robbery or, or right. something like that. And it's kind of messy. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's very messy. An opportunity murder is very mm -hmm. messy. Um, there's a vengeance murder mm -hmm. where somebody's humiliated you and you've planned, yeah. even if it was a quick and that's it's very fascinating for me because you refused to speak about it. Apparently, uh, you had one or two, uh, several encounters with your victim, mm -hmm. with Patricia Miller, whom you killed. You never talked about it and refused to talk about it, but apparently you were humiliated or repudiated by her. I do not know. Um, well, there, there were several events that had happened. and. As somebody who, who, I really don't want to, I don't know, saying something disparaging or pointing my finger at, mm -hmm. at my victim, I don't think would help me at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would help anybody at all. But there was, an, there was a couple of incidents between us and I felt terribly humiliated. That's about all I can mm -hmm. say. I, I, was, I was humiliated. Yeah. And there was premeditation then to kill her, yes. enter her apartment, kill her, yes. sexually assault her. Yes, all those things. Um, it, was, uh, it was very ugly, it was very brutal, it was very messy. Um, and I, there's no way to take it back.
Mr. Burden, you are the legal counsel for James Barnes, who is on death row. How far are his appeals exhausted? Well, he had his direct appeal with the Florida Supreme Court, and a uh, writ of certiorari has been filed with the uh, United States Supreme Court, and I believe that's pending. Um, if that has been decided, uh, he's now in what we call the post-conviction phase. And that is a time frame of a couple years that the capital collateral representative will have to present any post-conviction issues. James Barnes' case, in particular the murder of Patricia Miller, mm -hmm. looks to me like a monstrous crime. There's something really monstrous, scary, definitively evil about it. However, he does not appear to be a monster, in my opinion. I always try to see him and treat him as a human being. In your case, is your opinion somehow split between the facts of the case and the human being here in front of you who needs your defense? I'll tell you that uh, we, we all have feelings and we all have concerns. And uh, due process of law and the fact that we have this in this country is more important than my personal feelings about any of it. I, I was an uh, intelligence officer in El Salvador uh, during the 80s when uh, mm -hmm. there was there no due process. Yes. And I was in Panama during the Noriega administration where there wasn't due process. And you see how the lack of due process wears on a citizenry. It, it's horrible. They don't discuss things frankly with you. They be careful who they associate with and who they talk to. It's a different kind of society that I would never want to choose to live in. So I have very, very strong feelings that due process is far more important than the, the vagaries of an individual case. I could equally prosecute Mr. Barnes as defendant with equal vigor. It, the process is what's more important. And, and I, sometimes I think in the hysteria of the actual events, people forget the bigger picture. What really is at stake here is that someone has their day in court before their rights or their life are taken from them. You made some cryptic remark that there might be still something else out there. Do I misread it? Or? No, uh, there was much into innuendo is what I would say, the cryptic uh, innuendo. There, there are other, um, you know, there, there are other crimes out there mm -hmm. that I've committed that I've never been held accountable for. Um, would I ever come forward again um, and, and admit to these things? I think I picked the wrong agenda, the wrong platform last time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't believe... But would you eventually speak if you are strapped to the gurney uh, or shortly before when you have a last chance to oh, get, bring closure to families of victims or whatever? Um, would that be uh, on, on your agenda? That's absolutely uh, part of, uh, of something that I have thought um, greatly about. Um, the state of Florida is, is a state that they don't care about the, the consequences of mm -hmm. an individual's actions or... Yeah, but let's forget about the state. I mean, you're in a very grim situation and at, right. the, at the end of possibilities almost. Right. There is you as a human being, not dealing with a state, but dealing with personal guilt. Do I see that correctly? You do see that correctly. Um, there, there is no proper way to come forward and, and say how sorry one is or show remorse. Um, they say I'm remorseless. I'm not. I, I have cried so many nights, so many days. I've spent so much time trying to, to figure out how to balance the scale. Um, I, just, I just didn't see... I just didn't really understand the gravity of, of, of what this state would do to me, mm -hmm. you know, for coming forward and saying I'm sorry, right, yeah. and not offering anything other than, you know, I'm responsible. This is what I've done. This is exactly how it happened. There is no more questions in this case, um, and now I'm going to be executed. When he's in pain, it's like. I can feel his pain. Like, I mean, we've been estranged for a long time now, but back in the day when we were close or being raised together, I could feel his pain. I could feel his hurt. The hurt was so bad that I would be crying too. 
like if he was sent to a detention center or the juvenile detention center, I'm the one that would be crying at home. I'm the one that hurt because it was like we were ripped in half. It was like part of me was always gone. I would not celebrate our birthdays when he was not there, and I would not celebrate our Christmases. This is my siblings. This is my older sister, Beth, my twin brother, James, me, my little brother, Michael, and my little sister, Roberta. I'm not bitter anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm accepting. I, I hurt for James that he didn't make it. I hurt for my little brother, Michael, who committed suicide. And I survived. I could have been a statistic out there on drugs and alcohol, and I could be dead from the lifestyle. Is there a possibility that you will see him? Or do you have to settle with yourself first? I, I would like to see him, but um, I might not be allowed to. Um, but I think family members should have a possibility to, to see him. Well, I, I, I understand, but I think I might have a warrant down there for, for misdemeanor. Yeah, I mean, as long as I'm in Georgia, I'm fine. You were in trouble as well. I got in trouble, yes. Um, when, they, when they got divorced, I think I was about 16 years old. I, I did end up dropping out of school and uh, doing my own thing, uh, beach bum kind of lifestyle working in nightclubs, entering bikini contests, just uh, drugs and the alcohol and all the nightlife that came with it is what I did. So you were a bad girl. I was very bad, yes. I've, um, yes, I'm a two-time convicted felon for drugs and I've probably had over uh, 35 to 40 misdemeanor arrests for drug-related mm -hmm. incidences. And if you show up in uh, prison, they may decide to keep you <laughs> for a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had some horrible dreams here. I mean, absolutely, and especially when I first got here. Describe um, it. Wow. Uh, I remember my home in Maryland and the grass was very green there and for some reason my twin sister and I were buried up to our heads and my father was mowing the grass and he was pushing a lawnmower towards us and he he ran over my my twin sister's head and I've had that recurring dream about five times and it's it just messes me up inside uh, because My feeling is, don't do this to me, but I feel so terrified and, and repulsed by what just happened. The nightmares were so bad that I was mentally and physically exhausted during the day. And I could not understand why I had to have such horrific nightmares. Why couldn't I be normal like everybody else and have a normal dream? I have woken my husband up saying, you need to call 911 because somebody else was getting hurt and I was watching the other person getting hurt. And, you know, I woke him up telling him to call 911. <laughs> it wasn't me getting hurt anymore. It was somebody else. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, a couple real good dreams. Um, the one where God appeared to me. Um, um, oh, please describe. That's what I want to know. Well, okay, the scenario was um, something bad was happening and I was running from room to room to get away from this bad thing coming to get me. And um, all of a sudden I seen this light in this doorway and I was scared to go. I was scared to go behind any door because it, this, this person was going to get me. But I ran and all of a sudden there was this big, just big giant image of Jesus letting me know that nobody was going to hurt me now. And I was like, The dream's over, and I'm sitting there looking at God, you know, and I wasn't even sure it was God, and but I know it was. You can just tell, and Pastor Jan, she, I, I guess I invited her in my dream because I wanted to know, is this Jesus? And uh, she said, yeah, and ran out my dream, but it went from a real horrific scenario to just seeing God and and Him saving me, just 
it was just so big and such a glow and he's so perfect and yeah it was just really it was yeah it was a good dream so i was one of those that wasn't wired like everybody else i needed constant supervision i needed my my parents there and then you have to keep your family unit whole no matter what because people are going to make mistakes and if you can keep those mistakes private, it's best. That's what will keep the family unit strong. But if you have to go outside of your family with mistakes that others have made, you have to, you have to support them. You may not agree or like what the individual has done, but you have to love them and tell them that you support them. This might have been a juvenile detention center at 17. But he went to jail fairly soon after that. Yeah, he was always in and out of jail for all kind of stuff. Like? Theft, arson. Um, I don't really remember it all. Drugs. Drugs. So I remember our next door neighbor's house, next door to this house. Um, James did admit to doing that. He, well, I think he admitted it. He went in and, and burglarized them, and then he lit their bedroom on fire to get rid of the evidence or something like that. And then there was another fire out there where my father lived in a townhome that he had burglarized, and then he set it on fire too. And then uh, one time I think he had a BB gun, and when it rained, the frogs would all come into our pool, and he went around with this BB gun and shot them all. And he thought it was neat because the, the pellet come out through the stomach and you could turn it over and you could see the pellets where he just kept killing them and killing them and it just really broke my heart because, you know, we had a scooper, he'd scoop them out, but he thought it was okay to just shoot them all, look how neat it is. And Generally what they say when you look at the profiles that, that behavioral science has come up with, a lot of people that have done serial crimes, and particularly serial murder, um, have, been, have, have, have arson in their background have um, animal abuse in their background. I mean, as you, as, you, case. as you start to go through these things, those are some of the things that they see on, on some of the, the people that have been studied as serial killers. We have some vague indications, but not verified, that he strangled a family cat, mm -hmm. like cats. Right, which would fit uh, in. Always in trouble for arson. So yeah, there seem to be a lot of fires. That's about all I can remember on the fires for now. Except for, um, I was told about the last fire um, when he set the lady on fire. You do have a few absurd privileges, like a last meal. That's not what's going to be on my mind. That's not important to me. I have thought about it, and I do have favorite foods, you know. Like? Well, anything that comes off, any meat. Uh, beef that comes from a grill cooked on fire. I do. I, I'm just, I mean, I'm fixated, you know, on fire ever since I was a kid, but I, I love the smell and the, uh, yeah. the ritual of cooking, uh, you know, beef on a grill. It has nothing to do with you being an arsonist. I don't think so. Well. <laughs> no, because uh, any good chef is under a lot of, has a lot of flame in the kitchen anyway, yeah. whether they're outside or not. Right. But, uh, this is the home where most of the trouble started in. As you can see, this is uh, us looking like the Cleaver family, but it really wasn't. What happened inside those doors was very horrific. I still have flashbacks. My father would make us all go into this living room, as you can see in this window here, and he would close the blinds, and this is when James would do something bad, or Mom said he did, or Beth said he did. My father would have what they call a blanket party, as something he learned from the military. And I believe he actually used one of those blankets from the military, the old gray ones. And uh, he would put it over my brother's head, which this is my twin brother right here, and take a belt and make us all stand there and whip him. And if we didn't whip him, we were gonna get whipped. So he didn't know when he was gonna get hit. But by the time my dad got him out of the blanket, his face would be beat red would just tears streaming down and welts all over him. I just remember me screaming and crying throughout the whole thing. 
James started to withdraw and become angry. Didn't want to go to school because he didn't like going to PE because you had to dress out and he always had welts on him or whipping marks. The other kids would laugh at him. Was there sexual abuse? Well, um, I was told there was sexual abuse. I don't have any memory of it. I do have the frozen fear and I do remember being in my bed and people, someone coming into my room. I don't know who it was. Um, I don't know what they did to me. I was only told by my older sibling and my mother that I was sexually abused. But I can't say that who, who did it. I don't know. I have no memory at all. But they, they did say that's why James was taken out of the home. With his execution looming, four months after our first visit, we were allowed to see James Barnes again. He had had no contact with his family for over a decade. You do know that uh, we found your sister? Yes. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's one surprise that I would like to bring to you. Last night, we located your father. Oh, you did? We identified ourselves. He immediately declined to be filmed. And now I asked him specifically, uh, is there anything that I could pass on to your son, to you? And he pondered and pondered, and then he said, yes, please pass one thing on to my son. <clears throat> one, I love him. Two, I hate the crimes he committed. <clears throat> so, and he was silent then and looked at me and I said, Mr. Barnes, I will not fail to pass this on. That's, uh, it's been a long time. I, yes. Thank you so much. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, that's, I've been wanting to be in touch with him for so long. And to find out that you met him just last night, it was, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> wow. You know, years ago, I had, I had taken a self-inventory and I, I wrote lists about what things I've done in my life that I'm most ashamed of, what things in my life I'm most proud of, and then what in my life would cause me the greatest grief and what yes. in my life would cause me the greatest joy. And I found that the thing that would have affected me the most, because I knew I was never getting right. out, was if my father were to die while I was still alive, I would have been devastated. Well, I thought that that was the worst possible thing that could have happened to me, and I was wrong. The worst possible yes. thing ended up being I knew he was still alive and he didn't want anything else to do with me. That, that put me down hard for many years, and, and now I, I feel I feel so much better. I understand that he, he sees the ugliness of the things that I've done, and I understand anybody seeing that. You know, you could sit here and you could cry about what you've done. You could tell people how sorry you are about what you've done in your past. but. The fact of the matter is that the taking 100% responsibility for your actions is the most important thing in any, it doesn't matter whether you're the, the defendant or the victim in any type of, of incident, the person who's wrong needs to take 100% responsibility. Six weeks after our first encounter, James Barnes sent us a letter in which he hinted at the possibility of telling us about two more unsolved cases. I was suspicious of Barnes 
using me as an instrument either to procrastinate or speed up his execution by opening new cases against him. Could I address our last um, contact through letters and our last conversation where I was under the impression you know more than I do? Yeah. And that there are things out there that maybe the world should know. I have a list. Uh, you know how people talk about a bucket list? Yes. Well, no. I, have, I do have a list as well. Okay. I have <laughs> a list of things that I'm going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is to resolve all the unresolved crimes that I've ever committed. May I, may I mention two names? Right. You mentioned uh, Chester Wetmore. Yes. A young man, very young, a teenage. Yes, he was a teenage. teenage. Uh -huh. And Brenda Fletcher. Right. And the only reason why I knew her name is because I, I had seen her ID. But she was going under a, a different yeah. name when I had met her. We actually traveled north and we saw the water-filled ditch along the northbound on-ramp from State Road 520 to That's I... That's fish camp. Exactly, uh, yeah. to uh, Interstate 95. Correct, that's the place. I looked at it, it turns, it goes in a right curve, mm -hmm. in a soft right curve. If you were coming from the east, it would be on north. Northbound, yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. By examining unsolved homicide records, we learned that in the water-filled ditch to the right, the decomposed body of Brenda Fletcher was found. Brenda was a prostitute. She obviously didn't have any family or any roots. It's hard when you talk about uh, crack cocaine addicts to give an age, but she was, I would say, 40. She stole my wallet. She didn't have to steal my wallet. I, I only had like 30-something bucks, all right? All, all I really wanted was my driver's license back. And I told her that. I, I said, all I want is my driver's license back. Oh, I didn't steal. I said, I know you. You're the only person. You're a crack addict. I know what you did. I just want my ID back. If I get pulled over without it, I'm going to jail. I, I had already had a, driver, a suspended driver's license deal once before. And you were involved in this crime? Yes. And you were involved in Chester Wetmore? Yes. Let me talk about Chester Wetmore. Okay. He was missing since 27th of May, 1986. I ran across him in 1988. He was skinny, uh, I would say 5'9", five, 5'11", five, somewhere in between there. 17, 18, 19. He was a runaway. Yes. I knew that he was on crystal meth, but he had graduated to crack cocaine, but it didn't matter which drug he used. Um, I was very much aware, made aware by him that his family had been looking for him and he needed a I place mm -hmm. to hide. He needed a place. He'd been on the streets for a long time. Um, he'd been involved in prostituting himself. I mean, he, he, was a, he, he was a street person. I supplemented my income by selling drugs. Yes. And that's how I ran into him. And he ended up breaking into my car. And I was very, very upset because he took all my product. He took all my product. And I knew it was him. And, uh, and I, ended up, uh, I ended up killing him, and I ended up burying him. I took his body uh, next to a lake. Let's just say that there was a spot that had been prepared, not for specifically Chester. It was just it was an easy spot to throw someone in and fill up. He, he was still shiny. I don't know how to explain this, but before you get to a certain age, when, especially at night, um, and that's where I saw him most of the time, older people, they don't have a, a shine, a glean to their skin. He still had the young glean. He had the, you could tell, uh, I don't know how to explain this. He still had a glow. You still... You mean as an inner attitude, like you still have the world ahead of you, your whole life ahead of you? No, what I mean is descriptively, ocularly, yeah. is he still had the sheen, the sweat sheen, the, the glow. And children have it. Adults like me and you, we don't have... No, I may right now because I'm a, This is my second call out today. My ankles are killing me. They put the shackles on too tight the first time and they rubbed me raw. I'm... Oh my God. Plus, I'm way down at the end, and then the cell, it's, 
and it's humid today. Last time we were here, I was freezing. Um, but no, descriptively, he was still very young. He still had, he had the glow. Mr. Barnes, my impression is that the state of Florida is interested in one thing, What's and that? that is to kill you off. Oh, yes. So yes. that's, that's yes. number one. That's right. And I, I have my doubts that the state decides to indict you on any other crime, spend months and months of investigations, indictment, legal procedures, have uh, a, a trial against you again, spend millions of dollars and sentence you to death again. What's the point? <laughs> They, see, these are... They, they just want to kill you. Fast. Uh, right. There are a lot of different arguments in support of capital punishment. Um, deterrence and so forth. But we know it doesn't deter anyone. I, yes. We and I agree that. with that. Statistically, we know it. I think the only support for it is retribution. Yeah. An eye for an eye to speak. Which is biblical and it's Old Testament. Arguably but so. it's not what Jesus would try to tell us. So... Well, I have to tell you that uh, for the foreseeable future, capital punishment is here to stay. And it's very popular in this state. Uh, if you took an opinion poll, the citizens sure. of Florida support it. And uh, so I don't see it changing anytime soon. Yep. There is a, an overwhelming sense of shame along with the, the fear, the panic, and, and the knowing that so many people want you um, dead. Um, I mean, I'm already incapacitated. I'm in a cell. I'm chained, shackled. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got seven pounds worth of state jewelry on me. You're going to kill me now. Is that retribution? Is that vengeance? Yeah. Is that punishment? Is that going to change anything in this world for the better? It's not. You have to have imagination in order to cope. That's how I cope. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spend most of the time wishing for things I don't have. Things. Give me some details. All right. Um, I wish I was free. That's right. All right. Um, I wish I had no constraints. Um, I wish I, it was a hot day on the beach and I could jump in the ocean. That's like the, the thing that, that I really want to do is submerge myself and then come out and rinse off with, with fresh water. It's, I don't know, it's like a rebirth or a renewal. It's like I've been through so much and I've gotten so dirty and I can't wash it off. And the only thing that, that I can do is, is dream about how I would wash all the filth.